Hello, beautiful friends. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to wrap up the last five books that I've read. So this would be books 11 through 15 that I've read in 2023. Just in case this is the first time you are popping into one of these videos, instead of doing wrap ups at the end of every month, I am currently wrapping up every five books that I read. This is an attempt to keep these on the shorter side because if I were to do full month long wrap ups where I was wrapping up 10, 13 plus books, it would likely get very, very lengthy considering how long winded I am. So I figured that this would be a good compromise between doing monthly wrap ups and then doing like mid month or end of month wrap ups. If you have been watching this series for a little while, please comment down below. Let me know what you think and if you feel like it is working out for you as well or if you want me to try to switch to monthly wrap ups please let me know I would love to hear your feedback but without further ado let's go ahead and jump into the video the very first book that I have to talk to you about today A Vow So Bold and Deadly by Bridget Kemmerer so this is the third and final book in Bridget Kemmerer's Cursebreaker trilogy and because it's the third book I can't really say too much about this book or my feelings on this book without giving spoilers for the first two books I will talk briefly about what the trilogy overall is about but I will say that my feelings for this series are complicated and that's just because I love it so much and I love the characters and the world so much and I wanted to see certain things happen that just didn't and as much as I love the book and the characters and everything like that there are still some very complicated feelings attached to this series for me and I wrote very lengthy Goodreads reviews especially on this one and A Heart So Fierce and Broken and so if you are interested in hearing my in-depth thoughts on this series overall like if you don't have any plans on reading it and you don't mind spoilers or if you have read it and so you're okay with the spoilers as well please feel free to check out my Goodreads reviews of these books I will be sure to link them down below but if you are not familiar with this series the very first book is a so dark and lonely and it is essentially a beauty and the beast retelling but it's done a little bit differently than anything that i've ever seen done before so it follows our main character ren in the world of emberfall and he has been cursed by a sorceress to basically relive the autumn of his 18th year over and over and over and every single autumn he is supposed to find a woman to fall in love with him and if he doesn't he is going to be turned into this very angry beast that basically ravages his kingdom and by the time this book starts this has already happened several hundred times and it's basically just ren and his captain of the guard gray because the whole entire kingdom is basically dead or gone. And Grey is actually tasked with finding the women for Ren to possibly fall in love with. And so in A Curse of Dark and Lonely, he heads to Washington, D.C., where he finds Harper and he takes Harper back to Emberfell and it kind of goes from there. At the very end of A Curse of Dark and Lonely, something happens. Grey discovers something pretty important and it causes him to kind of flee Emberfell. He has to go kind of on the run. And book two is actually following him, which I was really, really ecstatic about because Grey is actually one of my favorite characters in this whole entire series. But my feelings become complicated in book two because it takes a direct different than what I wanted, especially with regard to Grey's character. And like I said, I'm not going to go into any further details. If you read my reviews, you'll know exactly what I thought about, but that didn't prevent me from still loving the series, loving the characters. I actually thought that this was a very solid ending to the trilogy and it kind of comes full circle to some things that happened in book one. I know I'm being very, very vague. It's not really helpful, but like I said, I'm trying to avoid as much spoilers as possible while still giving you some idea of what this book is and what my thoughts and feelings were. But overall, just know that I really loved this series a whole lot. I love the world. I love the characters. And I just love Bridget Kemmerer in general. I have read so many books by her at this point. I read her contemporaries. I read some of her young adult fantasies and she just never seems to disappoint. This might not have gone in the direction that I originally wanted. I might not have gotten some of the character relationships that I really wanted and I was really invested in, but still overall, still a very, very, very strong series. I gave this book a 4.5 stars. Completely switching gears, I actually finished Emma by Jane Austen. So I started this in mid-January. This was sent to me for January's monthly gifting. I'm part of a Facebook gifting group where every single month you get to post your wish list and somebody goes on your wish list and they pick a book and they send it to you and then you do the same and so on and so forth. So this was what was sent to me in January. And needless to say, when I received it, I was like, oh my gosh, that is a gorgeous edition. But of course it's a classic. I have a difficult time with classics and I had no idea that Emma was so chonky. This book y'all is over 500 pages. And even today, a 500 page contemporary, which is basically what this is. This is a contemporary or it was a contemporary back in the early 1800s when it was written. A 500 page contemporary is very, very long. And this felt long, which was my main complaint about this story. So if you're not familiar, the titular character, Emma, she is seen as a very clever, very beautiful, very privileged young woman, but she's also very spoiled. She is arrogant, she is meddlesome, and she is extremely judgmental. So she definitely has a lot of character flaws, and that is at the forefront of this book because this book is really about kind of working through those flaws and seeing her grow as a character. Emma kind of sees herself as a matchmaker because she successfully set up her governess with her governess's now husband, and so she's kind of taking it upon herself to do the same thing with some 
other people in her life. And she sets her sights upon young 17 year old Harriet Smith, who is a friend of Emma's, and she is trying to make a love match. And it kind of ends up going horribly because this young man actually had his sights on Emma. And when Emma rejects him, he goes and he marries somebody else. So that was disastrous. And Emma kind of decides to turn over a new leaf. She's never going to match make anybody ever again. And so this story is really about Emma and her interactions with the people closest to her and the misperceptions and the follies associated with trying to figure out who is in love with whom. This is about a lot of misperceptions about people and it's 500 pages of that. So I always have difficulty rating classics because first of all, I don't feel like I appreciate them as much as everybody else seems to. Like I don't go into a classic and when I'm done think, oh, that's why this is a classic. No, but I also think that that's a hindrance from my modern day perspective. I'm viewing a book in the 21st century that was written 200 years ago when the expectations, the times, everything was very, very different. And the lens through which I'm viewing this book tends to see these books as very pretentious, very overwritten and very, very tedious. And really Emma was no different, especially at 500 pages. So one thing I can say for certain is that if this book had been much shorter, probably a hundred plus pages shorter, I would have found it much more of an enjoyable reading experience. But as it was, it just went on for far, far too long. And like I said, this really is tedious because it's about Emma and her interactions with people and the back and forth of her meddling in their relationships or her trying to decipher who is in love with whom and her getting it all wrong. When I was in this book, I was actually in it and I was really enjoying it very well. But at the end of the day with classics, I can never say that they're going to stick with me. I can never say that I'm going to, in a year's time, really remember what happened in this book aside from the overall plot. So I give this a solid three stars. It wasn't a terrible reading experience. I definitely had a stronger reading experience with this than some of the other classics that I've read. I will say that Jane Eyre is still probably my favorite classic of all time, but I have now read three of Jane Austen's books. I've read Emma, Persuasion, and of course, Pride and Prejudice. And I'm getting to know Jane Austen a lot more as an author and to really appreciate her and what she is able to do. And so I'm very glad to have this stunning, beautiful edition of Emma on my shelves. I'm glad that I have read it. I'm glad that I have another classic under my belt. So was this terrible? No. But is it anything that's going to last in my mind? No. And again, I don't feel like I appreciate classics the way that everybody else seems to appreciate classics. But again, I am glad that I read this and I'm glad that I have it on my shelves. Okay, so the next two books that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to kind of talk about in tandem. And the reason is, is because I read these books back to back as part of the romance vlog that recently just went live on my channel. So not only did I read them back to back, but they are very similar in overall plot structure. And in that vlog, I kind of also use that vlog as a method of comparison between the two. I'm going to kind of use that same format here to talk about both of them because I don't think that I'm going to successfully be able to talk about one without talking about the other because they are so similar and because like I said I read them back to back and use that vlog as a method of comparison for the two. So the two books that I'm talking about are Every Summer After by Carly Fortune and Love in Other Words by Christina Lauren. So Every Summer After follows our main two characters Persephone Frazier or Percy and then Sam Florick. And at the start of this book you're following Percy who is now about 30 years old and she is getting a call from Sam's older brother Charlie and Charlie is telling Persephone that their mother has passed away and she is devastated because because she had no idea. And now she knows she's going to have to go back to her childhood vacation town to pay her respects to this woman who she loved deeply and who she thought of as a second mother. But this is going to be very difficult for Percy because of the history in that town, particularly with Charlie's brother, Sam. So when Percy was just 13 years old, her parents end up buying this vacation home on a lake. And next to their vacation home lives Sam, his older brother, Charlie, and their single mother who is raising them on their own after being widowed. Sam and Percy strike up a pretty immediate friendship and it ends up becoming a very close and valuable friendship to where they are like the most important people in each other's lives and you're following them over six summers as they develop that friendship and then as it turns into something more right up until the time they're 18 when something kind of explosive happens tears them apart and of course by the start of this book it is 12 years later they haven't talked to each other they haven't seen each other and Percy is returning to that town to pay her respects to Charlie and Sam's mother and of course she is going to reunite with Sam and you're going to see everything that comes along with it. I love this book immensely. I gave it five stars. This book gave me so much more emotion than I was expecting to receive from it and when I finished this book I I felt like I had an emotional hangover. I felt like my emotions had been run over by a Mack truck. I was so deeply invested in Percy and Sam's relationship. I was rooting for them the entire way, even when I found out the twist, why they spent 12 years from talking to each other. I definitely don't excuse the behavior and I didn't love the twist overall. And that made me consider demoting this from a five stars to a 4.5 stars. But because of the emotional hangover I got from this book, I didn't think it deserved anything less than a five stars. This was Carly Fortune's debut and I just felt like it was so solidly done in many, many aspects. First of all, I would consider this story very deep detailed and substantial because you are getting so much character development between Percy and Sam. So you're getting the present day as Percy is returning to that town as she is reconnecting with Sam, but you're also flashing back to those six summers that they spent together. And you are getting plenty of time in each timeline. So this was extremely well paced. And I feel like Harley Fortune set it up so that you are able to get enough of Sam and Percy's relationship prior to when they reconnect in the present. So at the very start of the story, you know something has happened. You know that this is something that has deeply affected Percy. It has affected the trajectory of her entire life. And now she's having to 
go back to this town and she both wants to and she doesn't want to. So you know something deeply troubling has happened. You know it has affected her greatly, but you don't know what. And before you actually get to the point where she and Sam are going to reconnect, you get at least one or two summers of her and Sam meeting and becoming friends and things like that. So you get that development and you get a chance to start connecting with her and Sam before they reconnect in the present. And then of course, when they do connect in the present, it's all that more explosive and meaningful and emotional. And then the story just kind of goes from there as you're following the past and then you're following the present and you're following what happens. And I just thought this was beautiful. I thought it was well done. I got the emotional impact of the story that I very much wanted to. And like I said, I gave this five stars. So now let's talk about Love in Other Words because I actually had no idea when I put Love in Other Words on my TBR for February that they were supposedly so similar. I had no idea whatsoever. I just knew that Love in Other Words was considered a very popular romance in the online bookish community. And that was what that entire romance vlog was about, was reading popular romance to see if I agree with the online bookish community. And then I was reading reviews for every summer after and there were people literally dissing this book because it was so similar to Love in Other Words. And they were like, you should sue for copyright infringement, Christina Lauren, because this is just like a complete ripoff. So that made me very nervous. That made me very nervous because one, I didn't want to immediately jump into a book that was super similar. It made me wonder if I was going to hate every summer after, after reading Love in Other Words, like if reading Love in Other Words was going to affect my enjoyment. I was really hesitant, but I decided to go ahead and jump into Love in Other Words. And let me tell you that within the first hour of that audiobook, it wasn't a very long audiobook. It was about four hours total of listening time for me because I listened on two times speed. So I was about 25% of the way through that book. And I already knew that not only is it sufficiently different overall, but that Every Summer After was way stronger and way better written than Love in Other Words. I know, blast me, because Love in Other Words is probably the most highly praised Christina Lauren. It is the one that gets the most hype. It has got like a 4.34 star rating on Goodreads. A lot of booktubers that I know absolutely love the story. And I thought that I was going to too. I thought that this was going to be my favorite Christina Lauren out of all the hits and misses that I've had from them, but that was not the case. Okay, so let me backtrack a little bit. In Love in Other Words, you're following our main characters, Macy and Elliot. And when she was just 13 years old, her and her dad, it's just the two of them. They lost her mother several years prior. They end up buying this vacation rental just to kind of get away when necessary. Next to their vacation rental lives the Petropolis family with Elliot being one of many children. And then of course, Elliot and Macy build a friendship and they kind of bond over books because when Macy's about to move into the house, she discovers Elliot hidden in her closet reading. And that's kind of how they meet and they start their friendship. And so in the past, of course, you're watching their friendship develop into something more until again, something tragic happens that split them apart. And at the very start of this book, it's been about 10 years since Macy has seen or spoken to Elliot. So you know something has happened to kind of tear them apart. And in again, in a similar vein to every summer after, you're getting flashbacks to their previous summers and then in the present day. So first of all, I wanna just say that I feel like there is enough differences in these books to distinguish them entirely. Not just in terms of plot point, but more significantly, the writing style. I cannot express enough how superficial and surface level I found Love in Other Words in comparison to Every Summer After. Like for the first 75% of Love in Other Words, I felt like it was a lot of tell and no show. And I really felt like the glimpses that you got into Macy and Elliot's relationship were not nearly as deep and in detail as Every Summer After. I don't feel like I got a good idea of Elliot and Macy's relationship to connect to them as characters. I didn't start emotionally connecting to the story or emotionally investing myself in this story and these characters until I was probably around 70% of the way through when we're getting towards the end of the story and Macy and Elliot are truly reconnecting and they're going to Elliot's brother's wedding and all of the secrets come out. Like they're finally starting to deal with all of the past, right? So I was 70% of the way through when I could stop eye rolling at this book and start emotionally connecting. Because let me, let me tell you some gripes that I have here, okay? So first of all, like within the first chapter, Macy and Elliot are running into each other. So you have no buildup, you have no lead in. You have no idea what the significance of this moment is supposed to be because you haven't gotten anything of that yet. Christina Lauren just tosses you in. Macy, she's there getting coffee. She sees Elliot and it just goes from there. Christina Lauren completely missed the boat on what could have been a very emotional and tense moment by just tossing you in. Second, immediately after that meeting, Elliot goes home and breaks up with his girlfriend because it wasn't right and he and Macy are destined to be together. So there's no angst there, at least on Elliot's part, because he is so happy to see Macy that he goes and he breaks up with his girlfriend to be with Macy because it's a sign from God that they're supposed to be together. She was the main love of his life and he just, he just goes in on it and he tells her about it too. And Macy's engaged. So right there, biggest eye roll of life. And you know, of course, Macy is trying to resist Elliot because she is engaged. But of course, you know, of course, Macy's relationship with her fiance isn't great. There's no real romantic chemistry. It's just kind of a for convenience relationship. So you know that eventually that's gonna end and she's gonna get with Elliot. No surprise there. That was the most convenient plot point. Christina Lauren's trying to add conflict, right? They're trying to add a barrier to Macy and Elliot being able to completely get together, but they didn't do a good job. It was like putting a traffic cone in the middle of the street, right? You know that you're easily gonna be able to get around that. And that's exactly what Macy's engagement was. It was just a traffic cone in the middle of the street. So Macy's not doing too terribly 
much to avoid Elliot. In fact, she invites Elliot on a picnic with her, her fiance, and some of their friends. Like why? And can we also talk about the fact that Macy's fiance really doesn't care at all about Elliot's existence. He doesn't feel threatened by Elliot or anything. And he's in fact, he's telling Macy, go and deal with what you need to deal with. Just do it. It's fine. Y'all, the amount of eye rolls that I experienced in this book. Oh, and can we also talk about the fact that Elliot invites Macy to spend Thanksgiving with him and his ex and then a friend of his? Why? Why are we putting ourselves into these situations? It is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. So like I said, it wasn't until about 70% of the way through this book that I allowed myself to get a little bit more emotionally invested because we're at Elliot's brother's wedding. Macy is reconnecting with their family. She realized how much she misses them and how much she loves them. And she's feeling so welcomed and adored by them. And then all of the secrets start coming out. Now, I will say that the ultimate twist in this story was a bit more dramatic and traumatic than the one that you have in Every Summer After. There's like a first little twist that is very similar to what happened in Every Summer After. But then there is a bigger twist that happens as a result of that first twist. And that was definitely heavy. That was a lot more heavy than I was expecting. And I give kudos to Christina Lauren for going there. And I can definitely see why this would be considered their most harder hitting story. But still, even though it did have that harder hitting element, it still wasn't nearly as deep and involved as I got in Every Summer After. So I feel very confident in saying that Every Summer After is the superior story here. And that if you're looking for these kind of tropes that you should go with that one. But I will also say that I don't think you can read one first without having it affect your enjoyment of the other. So I don't really think that you can read them back to back and enjoy them both on their own merits. I think you're constantly going to be comparing them and you're absolutely going to love one more than the other. But I do think that no matter which one you start with, you're going to be able to easily distinguish which one you love more, if that makes sense. So those are my two cents on it. That's my comparison. I definitely loved Every Summer After a lot more. I gave Love In Other Words a 3.5 stars, but I've already forgotten almost all of the details. The only reason why it got a 3.5 stars is because of that last like 25% of the book. But for the first like 75%, it was like a 2.5, three stars. So 3.5, in my opinion, was very generous for that book. I didn't love it nearly as much as the online bookish community does. I'm so sorry. I know that's an unpopular opinion, but it is what it is. All right. And the very final book that I have to talk to you about today is Just the Nicest Couple by Mary Kubica. Now, if you've watched the authors that I want to try in 2023, Mary Kubica is one of them. And I was very fortunate because this was the book that was sent to me for February's Facebook gifting. And it was just the perfect time because Mary Kubica was actually on my TBR to read for February. So it all just worked out beautifully. I didn't know that the first book that I read by her was going to be her newest release, but I'm glad that I was able to do it. So this is a story that is basically following two couples. And the very first couple that you're following is Nina Hayes, who realizes one day that Jake, her husband, is missing. At first, she doesn't think anything of it because the night before she and Jake had a really like knockdown drag out fight. She told him to leave and he did. He hasn't come home. He hasn't answered any of her calls or texts. And she thinks that he's just blowing off steam and then he'll be back. But after a couple days, he's still not back. And other circumstances kind of lead Nina to believe that Jake has left her. He is just not coming back. But then she starts to get calls from his work that Jake is not coming in. Now, Jake is a very respected neurosurgeon. He is very dedicated to his work. His work is like his entire life. And Nina knows that he would never itch work. And so she believes that he is officially missing, that something bad has happened. So she goes to the police and reports it. Then you're following Lily and Christian Scott. And Lily actually believes that she might've been the last person to see Jake alive. And she tells her husband everything. And her husband is determined to make sure it never comes out that Lily was one of the last people to see Jake alive. So you're following Nina's perspective as she's trying to figure out what happened to Jake. And you're following Christian's perspective as he's trying to prevent Nina from finding out what happened to Jake. And through their perspectives, you're also kind of actually finding out what happened to Jake or what could have happened to Jake. Is he dead? Is he alive? Is he missing? What is going on? And it is just a back and forth between Nina and Christian's perspective. So overall, I actually had a very enjoyable reading experience of this. I found myself pretty absorbed and wanting to know what happened, but yet still overall, I found this kind of like a mediocre and forgettable type of thing. And I don't think I'm going to remember anything about this story in a couple of weeks. Like I'm not even going to remember that I read this book in 2023. So while I do think that this was overall a very pleasant reading experience, it was still, I think like a forgettable reading experience. I will say that the twist is not one that I love. Was it a consideration? Absolutely. It definitely was a consideration. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility, the whodunit in this story. So it wasn't necessarily a surprise. It's just not a trope that I love. I don't want to say anything more about it because I don't want to risk spoiling the story or anything, but books with this type of outcome or this type of character are books that I actively avoid. And had I really known that this was going to be a thing, I might've avoided this book altogether because I just, I just didn't love it. But I did enjoy the journey. And that's really what a lot of these stories are about. It doesn't really matter if the twist is shocking or if I like the twist, but if the journey is solid, that is what I appreciate. And I did overall enjoy the journey. So I settled on a 3.5 stars for this one. Am I going to read any Mary Kubica in the future? I don't know. This was just a very middle of the road suspense thriller for me. And it didn't blow me away, but I didn't hate it either. Like I said, overall, a very enjoyable reading experience, but nothing out of this world. So I'm glad that I have it. I'm glad that I gave this a try. I'm glad that I finally know what Mary Kubica is 
capable of. I may try at least one other novel by her just to kind of see. But on the outset, I don't know. But like I said, very glad that I read it. Very glad that I gave it a try. And I'm not mad about it. Settled on a 3.5 stars. All right, y'all. That is it. Those are the last five books that I read in 2023. And of course, please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these stories. Let me know if you agree or disagree with me. Please let me know if you are angry at some of my thoughts, especially regarding Love and Other Words. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and there's another video to film. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.